Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. Active Human Evolution or Adaption by Captain Candy The Council was silent as the lead scientist gave his presentation on the recently discovered species, the Dawn, an insect-like species that shared traits with many other already part of the Galactic Council. As he finished his presentation, the council members prepared to move on to the next order of business. The lead scientist, however, didn't stop his presentation, instead saying, Now, esteemed council, I will be allowing my recently taken in protege to give her presentation. You see, she recently, in her travels of discovery, found another new sapient species. They haven't quite stretched out far beyond their own home planet yet. They are nonetheless incredibly interesting. I will let Holly here give you her the specifics. Ah, uh, thank you, Master. <clears throat> Esteemed Council, as my Master has said, I recently found a new race while out in travel of discovery. It was in the western part of the eastern arm, in between the second split of the arm. I was looking to explore the null space between galactic arms to gather data in rogue planets and stars. But while I was on the way, I ran into a radio signal and, uh, curious, I decided to follow the signal to its source. Upon arriving at the edge of the system, it became apparent that this was a second-generation star system. For those unfamiliar with what that means, essentially the entire solar system was surrounded by a thin veil of plasma stemming from energized gases from the previous star to exist there. In short, there was another star that was there once, and once it blew up, the current star formed. The leftover gas is excited by the magnetic field of the current star, Normally, systems like this cannot support life due to the excessive radiation that is held in by the layer of leftover gases. Noting this, I had my ship's computer increase the output of the energy shielding to compensate. Whatever race lived here, I was determined to find out how, whatever they are, they had to be at least 100 times more radiation resistant than any other known species in the galaxy, according to the readings I was getting from the computer anyway. At first, I thought it must be a distant moon or planet in the system, far from the star and rotationally locked to one side of the star. This would mean a whole planet was between them and the radiation blasting through their system. Still, just as the ambient levels would be enough to kill 100% of all previously known species. My hypothesis was proven wrong, however. Apparently the species lived on the third planet from the star. They are carbon-based at the same as 40% of the galactic species we know of. They were in the perfect habitability zone for carbon, so this made some semblance of sense. But the close proximity to the star should have meant that anything that tried to live on this planet would be mutated and decayed into oblivion. On this point, I wasn't exactly wrong either. I wasn't entirely right, though. The things on this planet do mutate wildly, and I'm pretty sure the first cellular structure to form did as well. But the mutation caused was one that most cellular life developed anyways. It mutated to be able to replicate itself. This is odd, as normally when life forms on a planet, millions of different cells form and grow, and one of them eventually forms just the right to be able to replicate naturally. The replicating cell becomes the dominant and takes over the planet, Eventually, somewhere in the replication, a change occurs due to the environmental factors. A high iron place, a low acidity water, something happens that makes the cell's DNA shift slightly. From their evolution as we know it occurs. Evolution for us is from generation to generation, and large evolutions take hundreds or thousands of years and cannot be done by an individual. The humans are different. Due to the high radiation, the cells there mutate wildly in a single generation in one individual cell or entity. Upon this revelation, some surprised looks and shocked gasps rang out. A race that could actively mutate and grow. Most council members imagined barely conscious blobs of flesh, wildly changing and shifting in form like eldritch horrors. But Holly cut them all off and continued, Now I know what you're all thinking, but no. They aren't some grotesque blobs of mutating flesh. Far from it. In fact, I'm just getting to the point where you will realize how incredible the humans are. Well, not just the humans, but every single species on Earth for that matter. You see, 
Of a life on this third planet from the sun learned to do something inconceivable to many of us. The life there learned to control the mutation and do something the humans call adaptation. We would all call it active evolution, though. I see some confused looks, so let me give an example. In my race, the Thorans lived in a warm environment with temperatures ranging between 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, that is a large temperature range, I know. My race is rather resilient like that. Now assume that we wanted to move into an environment with temperatures of 40 to 70 degrees. We'd have to slowly go into the territory, going as far as 5 degrees below our tolerable threshold. Over time, as we did this, the children in the wombs of the mothers would adjust itself to withstand the stimuli outside. Then slowly, generation after generation, we would make our way into the new climate. It would take three generations and sixty years for my species to do this. The humans, though, they can tolerate temperature ranges of, for example, minus forty degrees to one hundred and twenty degrees. Yes, you all heard that right. When I first saw the humans, I thought my computer malfunctioned and ran several diagnostics and rebooted it. But the numbers are correct. The reason for this is also adaptation, which is the active mutation of cellular structure and genetic makeup over the span of a creature's lifetime. Yes, active mutation during their lifetime. The humans' tolerance to these temperature ranges are because they can adapt or actively evolve over the span of as long as a few years and as short as a few days. A human accustomed to 100 degrees temperature, for example, after five years at maximum, they can be not comfortable but survive in minus 30 degrees to minus 40 degrees. Where our races would need tens of generations to adjust and adapt to conditions, humans can do it most of the time within one, and at most in three. Now, this is not just limited to their physical aspect, though. They are also able to adapt and adjust quickly to new technologies and ideologies due to a neurological form of this adaptability. This is something the rest of the galaxy does have, but to a much lesser degree. I'm sure all of you here are familiar with neuroplasticity, but compared to humans, the rest of us would be considered like stubborn slabs of iron in our thinking. This can be seen in some of the early first contact wars before the council was formed. People with minds too inflexible fought tooth and claw to kill one another, until only one ideology and empire remained. The humans, however, can adapt to and fit into a new culture they see as enjoyable in a matter of a generation. This shines especially bright in their development of technology. Due to the humans' high stamina and high adaptability, they developed thousands of different cultures and countries over their time of growth. Some of these countries, or nations, naturally were more advanced than others. But some of these less developed ones would steal, take apart and learn more advanced technologies, something humans call reverse engineering. The empire that best exemplified this on Earth was one called Rome. This was a nation that advanced many facets of its technology, ideology and culture by taking these in from small city-states and nations that they could conquer. This propelled them ahead of every other nation on the planet at the time in terms of technology, quality of life, quality of education, and military strength. Now, the reason I felt it necessary to surprise the Council with this new information is due to the fact that while observing them, I lost one of my drones that malfunctioned and wouldn't enter stealth mode. It was just shot down by the human's weapons, and I fear, even as you speak, it is being reverse engineered. The drone had FTL communications, cloaking and scanners for just about everything you can think of. It also had an emergency FTL jump drive that also due to malfunctions did not activate. I can only hope that this emergency FTL drive is unusable and therefore useless to reverse engineer. I doubt it. So dear council members, I believe that the humans will be joining the galactic community soon, within a generation, and we all need to prepare. Video are the first known mention of humans amongst galactic community. End of story. Story number two. Never challenge human. Written by Real Nectarine 7986. I, Norsh of the Glisporian people, have prided myself for being the best drinking champion in the entire galaxy. Throughout the years, I have won more drinking competitions than anyone in recorded history of the Galactic Drinking Championship. Until they came. 
Humans are a young species, having only been members of the galactic community for around 50 years. I never believed that such a young species, so violent in war yet so friendly in peace, would be able to compete and win. No, winning means they had some form of competition. Now that I think of it, they did. No, the horror. The absolute horror. I made the mistake of challenging a group of human tourists to a drinking competition in a human pub. Myself and five humans. And the alcoholic beverage that was used this time was something the humans called whiskey. The humans called them shots. I called them children's cups. Until I learned that this whiskey kicked like a rabid beast of the plains they call a horse. The first to fall from the table was a human originating from some place on earth known as South Africa at 18 shots. It I didn't last long. Just one more shot than the South African, and I was feeling the pleasantly cool floor at my back. I oh, get your arse back in the blimey seat. Uh, what just getting started? The human from Scotland said. The humans from Germany and Ireland nodding in agreement, whilst the human from Russia just sat there not giving a damn. I don't know who won that competition. It definitely wasn't me or the South African. I awoke the next day to a skull-splitting headache. No, that would mean that the pain alone is what woke me up. No, that damned Scotsman had brought along an instrument of his people. Think that. It was a weapon of mass destruction, I tell you. Those vampires through loud added super fuel to my already painful headache. How in the name of, how are you people all right with this racket? I asked the Irish, German, and Russian human. You better start drinking more. The last night was just a warm-up for those two, the German said, indicating to the Irishman and Scotsman. I myself just had a cold shower, and the Russian over there just started drinking again. And the South African, I asked him. He's out watching the rugby match at the stadium, he answered. That day, I learned a valuable lesson. Never challenge a human. It isn't good for your health. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnolds, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.